Well, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining me today. And the topic today is facilitating engaging online discussions. And I will be sharing some instructional design best practices and online learning guidelines and also best practices that I found um, doing research to prepare for this presentation. And of course, from my personal experience facilitating and designing uh, online classes and training programs and also working with faculty who design uh, and teach uh, online classes. My name is Ekaterina Stoops. I'm an instructional designer, and I have uh, years and years of experience in instructional design and learning and development, uh, facilitating and also developing e-learning courses and programs, training programs. Okay, let's dive into this presentation. And I decided to start my presentation with this slide and kind of, kind of go a little bit about the difference between facilitating discussions in in-person classes and um, facilitating uh, discussions online, in online, and perhaps also in hybrid classes, and how students really react or what they think about discussions done in class and discussions done online. Again, I'm going to just share some experience, my personal experience, working with students, hearing uh, the comments, uh, facilitating discussions myself, both online and in person, and also working with faculty who also shared some of the uh, their concerns and the feedback from their students. So, Usually what I noticed is that students react very well to discussions that are done in class. They tend to really love uh, group projects and collaborative activities in discussions uh, in class. But when it comes to online, student reaction, you know, ca it can be mixed. Some students actually uh, really love it. And some students, they kind of perceive it as a waste of their time. It's pretty common, actually. Again, I'm just sharing my experience and my perspective and what I've heard from the students and faculty. So they perceive, sometimes students uh, may perceive discussions, online discussions as, the waste, as a waste of their time. So they sometimes don't understand why they are being asked to participate in this discussion. How is it going to help them learn? Uh, what's the connection between the content and the discussion that they've been asked to do? So also there is sometimes this belief that students or common that students share that, you know, discussions don't count toward a final uh, grade. And especially if a discussion is designed as ungraded, so they definitely would have that feeling. So in, they perceive anything that is not graded, they perceive of, as, uh, the, as a waste of their time. Also, another comment from students that I hear a lot is, well, my classmates have already, uh, my peers have already shared everything that I want. I wanted to, to say on the discussion board, and I have nothing else to say. So that actually happens quite common, especially if students, uh, um, you know, don't submit the um, responses on the discussion forum early. They wait until the due date, and then everyone in class has already submitted their responses. And because of the nature of online interaction. It's done mostly uh, in writing. So you can um, see a thread of, you know, responses and you may get this feeling that, you know, I really don't have anything else to contribute to this discussion. Another comment from students that I hear a lot is, well, my instructor is not participating, so why should I bother? There is this belief um, students really truly believe that the instructors need to be present and need to participate uh, in discussions. If they don't see that, it, they, they are very disappointed. The reason is, the reason why is I wanted to start my presentation with this kind of common challenges because they're common. And again, um, I'm all basing um, I'm using my personal experience as an instructional designer, as a faculty development coordinator, also designing and facilitating my own online training programs and classes. So I hear these comments a lot. And 
throughout this presentation, I'm going to address this uh, challenges and we're going to talk about how to make, mitigate them so that we don't have these challenges in our online classes. And I divided up this presentation into two parts. The first part that starts with this slide, um, I will focus on different examples of different discussion prompts, different discussion uh, type of uh, type of activities that are highly engaging that um, could uh, will encourage your students to really participate in a discussion and share their opinions and ideas and perspectives. So examples is the first part. And the second part, we'll talk about designing a course, setting expectations, building community. That is also, these aspects are also very important if we want to make um, our classes engaging and collaborative and uh, build community in our classes, which contribute to quality of discussions uh, that are happening among the students. So let's start with examples. I have prepared several really wonderful examples. And the first one is case studies. Case studies is an excellent way to engage students. And this example of a case study I uh, found on um, from the article and I um, you know, put it on my slide. And the title of the article is online discussion questions that work. So I just thought it's an excellent example of a case study. And we're going to talk about how you can develop your own case studies in a minute. Uh, this case study, I'm going to read out loud. A 72 year old man is admitted to the hospital for a kidney transplant. His daughter is brought in as the best available match as a donor. As the man's doctor, you discover from the lab work that the daughter is not a suitable donor because she's not his biological daughter. So what would you say to the man, to the uh, to the wife and the daughter? So I, I forgot which class it is uh, from ethics class for probably. But the point is that this case study or any case study will uh, develop case study. It really encourages students to apply critical thinking, also allows for unique answers. Remember that comment from the first slide where students are saying, well, I've already said everything. Oh, my, my peers have already said everything. Well, this case studies, they're never black and white. You know, there's always room for interpretation and every student can have a unique perspective on ideas. So it really, they really do allow for a variety of different answers. And also what is important with case studies and next example, controversies, is that they fall under the category of real life examples and scenarios that you want to bring to illustrate certain concepts, trends from your industry. It's a connection between the coursework and the industry that bring uh, that excitement and extra motivation uh, in your classes. Controversies, similar to case studies, but I guess it's a little bit different because a little bit of drama involved. I don't know. This is a great example too. I found it again in, from the same article, online discussion questions that work in a I will read it and then we'll talk about where to find case studies and controversies. A fundamental tenet of information security is that you must force the user to periodically change his or her password. But this practice actually undermines security. With constantly changing passwords, users are forced to write them down in an easy to find location or easy uh, or use an easy to guess algorithm. We're better off letting users keep the same password indefinitely. Do you agree? Well, <laughs> um, probably cybersecurity. Uh, that's the course. I'm not sure. But well, I don't know much about cybersecurity, but even I have my own opinion about this example. So the point with controversies and real life examples and case studies and scenarios is that they bring real examples from the industry, from real life. And uh, so there's this connection between what students are studying and how it is in real life. And that is what can generate a really nice, wonderful discussion among the students because they like the Ashley students like those real life examples. Now, when I talk about case studies, real life examples, scenarios, controversies, I always get a question about where to find them. Sure, you like the idea, but where to find them? Well, I don't know if there's like a repository where 
uh, you can go and find all kinds of examples that would be applicable for your courses. Maybe. I actually asked that question to our librarians and they said, yeah, sure, we can actually help faculty find those resources. So my advice to you would be to work with your librarians and they can find you do that research and find those examples. But in my cases, I can never find examples that work for my uh, training programs. I create my own examples. And here is why. I consider myself a subject matter expert in my field. I have a lot of knowledge and experience in my field. Also, I always keep, at least I try to keep up to date with the current day trends and developments. I uh, keep up with uh, professionals, other professionals in my field through LinkedIn, through networking events, through workshops. Um, I read a lot. So it helps me understand what uh, trends in learning and development and instructional design are out there. So I can bring those examples into what I do. I can easily create a case study, write my own case study, controversy, real life scenario, and use it for my training purposes. And I uh, would encourage you to do the same because you are subject matter experts in your field and you can easily develop, create your own examples that will work for your courses. Also, another idea could be to work partner with other faculty members from your program who teach similar courses and you can develop like a, a repository of such examples and use them together uh, for your courses. So that would be my recommendation. Other examples that I have prepared fall under the category of reports and research. So this example, so reports and research in general, are excellent to use as discussion prompts. They work really well. And the first example is web field trip. And um, there are many ways how you can structure this type of activity in your course, but here is one example. Instructor provides uh, a link or a series of links. Students follow the links and then report back through an instructor defined set of questions. Students then review two or three reports posted by their peers and comment. There are two layers in this example. The first one is where instructor provides links in or students can find those links too. They can do the research and then they put together a report following the question. So that already implies that students are doing analysis, synthesis, evaluation of information. And the second part, uh, you could, where students comment on each other's posts, you can set it up as peer reviews. And peer reviews is an excellent way to engage students. So you can assign, for example, a Katrina will do a peer review for John. And in order for peer reviews to work, uh, it's important to include a rubric that your students could use to um, provide that analysis and review of uh, their peers' work. So that is really key you know, uh, to make peer reviews work. Also, in terms of the format for the reports, uh, you could diversify formats and you could maybe for one assignment, everyone submits their reports in writing. For another similar assignment, if you have a sim another similar assignment in your course, you can ask your students to record a video or uh, report doing this report, reporting something or record an audio podcast. So my point is, you know, just because it's online, it doesn't have to be all in writing. It could be a variety of different formats that you could use or give students a choice to use. And that would also create an interesting dynamic in your, in your class. But not, maybe not all students will choose to do this video, audio, but it, at least you can give your students that choice. And uh, that would be wonderful and aligned with the principles of the universal design for learning. Another example is discussions of course readings. And here you could say, well, everyone does it, but I have a twist for you here. Here's an example. Instructors set up discussions around assigned readings and uh, what is different from just general discussions here is that you would set up a pre-reading question or set of questions that are more of an anticipation style and post-reading style questions, more of an evaluation and application style. And just by separating questions into pre-reading and post-reading could help generate uh, a really rich and dynamic discussion among students. 
this is how I would do it if I were to teach this, if I were to do this uh, training that I'm doing right now live asynchronously. So I would set up a discussion board and I would post first question. And the question, question could be, what would your students say about online discussions in your course? And that is more of a pre-reading uh, style question. So you would submit your answers. And then I would uh, record this uh, lecture that I'm giving right now. And I would post the recording for you to view. And then um, I would ask you to answer the second question. Uh, what would you, oh, how would you make your discussions more engaging, share two or three examples with your colleagues? And that would be the post-reading question. To make it uh, even more challenging, I could ask, I could give you uh, participants who enrolled in this training modules a choice whether to submit their posts as video recordings or audio recordings or in writing. So that could be a, a nice way to diversify uh, formats for your discussions. There are two more examples fall under the category of reports and research, and it's research bank and observations and experiments. These are the examples from some articles that I have used to prepare for this presentation. And by the way, in, um, I'm including all the articles in the links in case you want to review them. So research bank, and here's an example of how you can set it up. Students and instructor contribute links and citations to a common area uh, for a class, uh, and by common area, you mean a discussion board for a class research topic. So here students um, and uh, instructors can work together as a cohort to research different links and citations on a common research topic. And observations and experiments, uh, students observe or participate in an experiment, for example, outside of the class, and then report back with their observations and findings. And again, for the report, it doesn't have to be something that they do in writing. It could be video formats, audio formats. So think about ways to diversify formats for how students have submitted their assignments as well. <clears throat> and here I have several examples of activities that you could set up as discussion board activities, but they fall under the category of group activities. And using group activities in online classes is a great way to engage your students. Depending on whether it's just a small group project or a big group project, you may want to think whether you want to just do it once once per term, or if it's smaller, maybe a couple of group projects because they, they are time consuming for the students. And also depending on how you envision this group uh, project, you could use groups in your learning management system or just use general discussion board activity to set it up. So these examples, I found them on purpose. I'm sharing them on purpose because they are very easy to set up using general discussion board. Uh, in your LMS, you don't have to set up groups in your learning management systems. Uh, the first one is group brainstorming. Again, so many ways how you could set it up, but here's one example. Students work in small groups. I would suggest no more than five people to brainstorm ideas on a given topic without evaluation. First, instructors set up several shared documents, for example, Google Docs, to allow students to brainstorm asynchronously. Or you could set up several Zoom links or whatever video, um, any video conferencing platform you're using. So you could set up links so that each group could meet synchronously if they want. Basically, you would give students a choice, each group a choice, how they would brainstorm as a group synchronously or, or asynchronous and provide links either to share documents or to a video conference and platform you're using. Then after that, each group would submit their ideas, put it together, and then submit the ideas on a discussion board for a larger group for, for the whole class to evaluate and critique. And uh, for the evaluation piece, you can also set it up as peer review. Each group could peer review other group submissions or individual students can peer review it, um, other students' submissions. Um, it's up to you, but it's also kind of adds um, a layer of complexity. Peer reviews always, you know, work. 
and but it's um, it's a great way to engage students. Group analysis is similar to group brainstorming, but of course it's more of an al analysis. Students work in small groups on a common uh, case followed by a large group analysis on the discussion board. And you could assign a different topic or a different task for the, uh, for the research and analysis to different groups. So when they come together on the discussion board to analyze each other's work, they analyze in different um, topics, different tasks, different things, so, because each group worked on a different task. So that could bring um, a lot of excitement and just interesting discussion. Uh, another example is collaborative writing. For example, if um, like English courses where students write essays, instead of writing individual essays, um, you can put students in groups and then each group would write a collective or collaborative essay and then they would submit their, each group would submit their work on the general discussion board and they would peer review each other's work. And the last example is debate synchronous activities. So just because it's an online class doesn't mean that students can't meet synchronously via Zoom, uh, any other conference, video conferencing platform to do group presentations, to do some work like brainstorming, for example, as groups. You would obviously, it would depend on your class because obviously there's a reason why students are taking classes online, maybe they can meet at the same time together, but it also could be an option if that works for your students. And now we are getting into the second part of my presentation that uh, focuses on preparation, development, setting expectations, building community and modeling. You may have wonderful case studies, real life examples, set up all kinds of discussion, uh, group activities in your or research type activities in your courses. But once you facilitate your class, you still feel like, you know, students are not engaged, kind of discussions are flat. And it could be a, a lot of reasons for that as well. And we're going to talk about other reasons why discussions may not feel engaging. One of the reasons is maybe the way you designed your course. And <clears throat> ideally, uh, we all instructional designers, when we work with uh, on course design, help with course design, we we'll always say, you know, ideally, in an ideal situation, a, an online course needs to be fully designed from start to finish before you start teaching your course. But obviously, in reality, sometimes it just doesn't happen for a variety of different reasons. And you may have like first several modules designed and then you're designing them the rest as you're teaching the course. But ideally, a course needs to be fully designed before you start teaching it. Uh, as you are developing designing your course, it's very helpful for you as a designing course designer, developer, faculty, to kind of have some questions in mind as you're developing your course. And for me, it always helps to think about this question. So the first question I always keep in mind is how many discussions do I want to plan in my course? Is it going to be weekly? Is it going to be bi-weekly? The second uh, question I ask myself, what type of activities uh, discussion prompts do I envision? Is it going to be group activities? For example, uh, if it's group activities, do I want to just use general discussion boards or I want to set up groups in Canvas or Blackboard? If I do want to go with groups, then it's uh, it's a it's a lot of design work. So I need to really pre-think how I'm going to facilitate in groups, how I'm going to be managing groups and things like this. And another question I like to ask myself is how each discussion I am implementing in my modules going to help achieve my students to uh, is going to help my students achieve the, the course learning outcomes. So one of the complaints for my students, they don't understand why they've been asked to do the discussions because they don't understand the connection between discussions and the course, the course outcomes. So by making this connection crystal clear for your students, it's going to help them 
uh, learn and be more engaged and be, mod be, be more motivated. And here, I wanted to share a template that I borrowed from a Renton Technical College. So I found this uh, template that they're using. It just has everything that I, as a faculty or as an instructional designer, need to design good discussions. So I like that it has this category of purpose, outcomes, and then for initial posts and then follow up and tips for success. The first one is purpose and then outcomes. It really helps students have a clear, better understanding why they're doing this discussion and how participating in this discussion, research activity that is uh, done as a discussion, uh, how this assignment and activity is going to help them learn, achieve one of the course learning outcomes, because you are making it crystal clear for your students. You, you could say the purpose of this discussion and you state the purpose. And then through this discussion, you will be able to, and you state uh, one or two of your course learning outcomes. Two, the other sections, initial post and follow up, is also excellent. By separating due dates for initial post and for the follow up, you can actually mitigate lots of challenges. Here's one of the most common scenarios that happen in online classes. Let's just say a discussion board activity is due on Wednesday at 11 p.m. So, what happens usually, not always, but sometimes, uh, students submit their posts like on Wednesday, clo as close to the due date as they, you know, as it's just maybe sometimes 10 p.m. or 10.55 p.m. So, and what happens is that it just doesn't allow anyone, um, it doesn't give anyone time. If everyone submits late, then you can have a follow-up discussion with each other uh, because you just simply don't have time for that. What if you say something like the initial post, your original post is due on Monday at 11 p.m. And then the follow up, that peer review piece is due on Wednesday at 11 p.m. So that gives students two days to engage with this, with each other, read each other's posts, do peer review and comment on each other's submissions. That, that can mitigate uh, lots of challenges. And this, the last uh, section of this template is tips for success. I just thought it was brilliant because sometimes like if you do some sort of group project and uh, research, you may want to include some specific tips for success to help students complete that assignment. So I just thought it just a wonderful reminder for all of us to include those steps for students. Setting expectations is also going to be very important if you want your discussion be effective and collaborative and engaging. You may have wonderful discussion prompts, spend time coming up with great case studies or research projects for your students, and even develop a great course. But discussions are still not highly engaging. So why? Well, another reason for why this could be happening is because uh, maybe you didn't set expectations clearly. And this is what that means. Basically, students need to know what expected of them in discussions. Think about students. So they may be taking multiple online courses or hybrid courses, and they're each instructor has different expectations. We all think that uh, our expectations are common to the point, but everybody has different rules. So it's important to explain to students what your expectations are. Your grading expectations, so including a rubric is very important. Communication expectations, deadline expectations, any expectations that you, anything that you expect students to do, you need to tell them. So you could tell them uh, by, you know, having that uh, spelling out tips for success. That's a template that we just uh, looked at. Uh, tips for success. That could be an area where you could put your expectations for each activity. You could put your expectations in the netiquette. That could be communication, general communication expectations, norms. Uh, put them in the syllabus. Uh, communicate through video announcements. Many ways to do that. So if you want to, but it's important to actually talk about your course expectations, communication norms, netiquette in the beginning of your term. The first week of your class is crucial 
crucial for setting those expectations. So include the syllabus, include the communication norms, um, make sure that students reviewed those documents, maybe set up a quiz uh, with some questions from those documents and then uh, do adaptive release so students can't start um, your first module until they actually uh, have taken the quiz. Or you could spend some time working on this netiquette set of communication rules and expectations together with your students during the, the first week of your term. Another reason why sometimes discussions may not be engaging is because students don't may not feel that um, they are in a community. So when we teach in person, uh, as faculty, we don't, I don't feel like we don't, well, um, we don't really need to spend that much time building up our class communities. Because as humans, we <clears throat> tend to develop relationship pretty easily if we share the same physical space. We start talking to each other. In an online environment, that doesn't happen automatically. You really need to uh, do all kinds of strategies, implement all kinds of strategies to make sure that in your online classes, uh, there is uh, students can develop relationship with each other and also with um, with you as the instructor. And uh, you need to make sure that your students feel that support and feel like it's a community in their class. There are many ways I feel like I can do another presentation, a separate presentation just on this topic. But just very quickly, some strategies that I want to mention. So in the beginning of your online class, always, always, always give students an opportunity to introduce themselves. Talk about their hobbies, talk about their interests, why they're taking this class. Do the same for yourself. Students need to know who you are. Uh, I always encourage faculty to do video announcements in their courses. Maybe not every week, but at least um, in the beginning of the uh, your term, so that students can see you um, through the video. So an excellent way to connect with your students is through video announcements. Also, I like to start class or training with Zoom or in obviously like any video conference and platform, but with a live uh, session. And of course, not everyone would be able to make it. So I could record it, but I could do, for example, I like to do a general discussion board where I give everyone an opportunity to introduce themselves. I also offer a Zoom session where we can meet together and I can talk about, uh, I can do some icebreakers to, you know, uh, do some relationship building. Also, I could go over course expectations, requirements, communication norms. So, and then I would record the session for uh, anyone who couldn't make it. Uh, virtual office hours is also important to offer throughout the, uh, the term. Lots of different strategies that you can employ to build that community. And that could make a real difference in the quality of your student discussions because and interactions, because if students don't feel like, you know, they can open up because they don't know their peers because they didn't even have an opportunity to get to know their peers because of the way the course is facilitated. That's go, it's going to impact the quality of the discussions. Also like to um, always mention that uh, diversifying your discussion formats uh, you, by using, since it's an online course, we're talking about online learning, uh, by using different tools is also a great technique. Like I mentioned <clears throat> earlier, instead of relying on writing or written text or written reports, you can give students a choice how they could submit their activities and posts, uh, maybe review video recordings, maybe audio recordings, maybe uh, working, if it's a collaborative activity, working asynchronously sh through a shared document like Google Docs, for example, uh, maybe setting up uh, some synchronous live sessions through Zoom teams for some group presentations, debates, and discussions. Just think about different tools that you could use to create a uh, excitement in your course. But I want to caution against two extremes here. You also don't want to like throw all these different tools and things each week because it's a, a lot of work for your students to figure out how to use different tools. Implement different tools and formats very carefully without overwhelming your students. But you also don't want to do another extreme uh, where 
every single activity in your course each week is the same. That's what kills interaction and motivation. So you don't want to be um, too much on, you know, too, you don't want to throw too much in your course and you don't want to create um, monotonous experiences for your students. So somewhere in between is going to be ideal. And my final strategy is modeling. So that's also what makes communication and engagement in your course work. If you, you, if you want your students to do certain things, you need to model those behaviors. And students actually expect the faculty to be present and to moderate and facilitate discussions. But you also don't want to like do uh, fall into this extremes with modeling where you're dominating in your student discussions. I actually personally don't believe that you are supposed to be answering or commenting on every single post on the discussion board. Yes, when you're grading student submissions that are done through discussion board, yes, you need to provide individualized feedback perhaps, but commenting on every single post on the discussion board, especially if you have large classes, I don't feel it's necessary. And it just feels uh, like you're dominating. It's your student discussion and you need to have this balance. Perhaps a better approach could be like if you uh, see that uh, one of your students submitted a great po uh, um, shared a great thought or idea, so, but you want to expand on it, maybe by providing some extra research or giving a different perspective. And that, that's where you can chime in and uh, use the discussion board and student uh, what students are sharing as an opportunity to maybe dig deeper at a different perspective, share maybe an extra resource. And that's what um, I call a balanced approach. Also, sometimes you might feel that students are having some side conversations that on their discussions, uh, discussion boards where it just doesn't have anything to do with the topic. So you could also politely let your students know that they can continue this conversation perhaps uh, um, using student lounge. And that could be just a general discussion board that you set up for the class where they can have some interesting conversations that don't necessarily pertain to uh, each module, but it's still interesting because of the topics you're discussing in the course, something like that. So moderating student discussions, being present is very, very important. And my last slide, I just wanted to show that um, uh, some links to resources and research that I used to prepare for this presentation. And uh, now let's get into uh, our discussion about discussion. So we'll have a Q&A. And thank you very much for staying with me and let's have a discussion now.